thank you all for being here. Thanks very much to Neem to hosting me. Um, yeah, so you catch me in the middle of the two weeks residency that I'm doing here, um, which is part of an ongoing interest in some of the questions of citizenship and identity that I'm going to talk about a little bit. Uh, and so because I'm in the middle of it, this will be a little bit expansive. Uh, so I'll show some of my projects to kind of explain how I think and talk about some of the things that I'm thinking about while I'm here. And maybe uh, afterwards at the end as well, we'll have some discussion of those things because uh, I'm here to find out more. Um, but yeah, hi, I'm James uh, and I, uh, I'm an artist and a writer and a number of other things. And I basically get weirdly obsessed with things and uh, spend too much time exploring them and thinking about them. Uh, and because of my background and the things that I'm interested in, I tend to think about those things kind of through the lens of technology. Um, I tend to look at new technologies, play with them, investigate them, see what they seem to be saying, not really about the technologies themselves, um, but about the kind of the state of the world that produces them, how they reflect how we're thinking about the world, uh, how they start to change our appreciation, understanding of the world. Uh, my kind of operating thesis is usually that new technologies don't necessarily sort of create entirely new things out of themselves, or rather they reveal things that may previously have been hidden, previously difficult to see. Um, and if, if we can understand them, if we can think with them and through them, uh, they allow us to think about the world as it actually is in, in new ways. Um, so I'll start by giving a couple of examples of that, how, how I think about that stuff. Um, so kind of my, one of my favorite go-to examples for playing with this way in which uh, technologies and the way we engineer them help and change our way of thinking about the world um, is Wikipedia as a kind of useful subset of the internet itself. And I'm sure most of you here have used Wikipedia at some point, and I'm sure you're mostly aware that it is an encyclopedia that anyone can edit. Um, and so you can go to a Wikipedia page and you can hit that edit button uh, or you can't in the case of the Cyprus page, I realized today, uh, because it's, uh, it's protected, uh, which is Wikipedia's term for when things are slightly too complex to allow anyone to have a go at them, uh, which I'm sure is a situation we all recognize in this case. Um, but most articles uh, you can edit. Uh, but also the other thing that I love about Wikipedia is not just that editing thing, um, it's the other uh, button at the top there, which is the history. Uh, so Wikipedia doesn't just allow anyone to edit an article, it also records every single edit that's been done to it. And if you hit that button, you can see the history of every single article that's been written. You can see the process by which various people have added to and changed that article over time. Uh, and I think this is, this is an extraordinary thing, um, because it makes visible a process that was previously uh, invisible to us. Uh, when you were presented with an encyclopedia or presented with this kind of finished version of history, uh, which of course is not true because history is never finished. Um, so a few years ago I took um, a single article on Wikipedia, um, which was the article on the Iraq War, uh, which at that time was about seven years old on Wikipedia and had uh, tens of thousands of edits had been made to it. And I, I was working in publishing at the time uh, and I love books, so I thought I'd make a book out of it. Uh, and I typeset it. I took every single edit that had been made to that article, uh, the entire change log it's called, so every single change that had been made to that article, and I typeset it properly like a book, and I bound it as a hardback. Uh, and when I did that, I found it actually came to be this 12-volume set of books, right? This huge, uh, weighty tomes that was basically the same size as what we think of as a traditional encyclopedia, but was just the history of a single article. Um, and it's really nice just to print stuff out sometimes uh, because, you know, we're not terribly smart creatures, basically. Uh, we live in a world where most things are kind of hidden within these weird little devices and we don't think about them very often. And so to actually make something tactile and tangible in that way, something you can poke and hold in your hand and feel the weight of it, changes how you're capable of thinking about it. And so to see the extent of this digital information printed out allows us to kind of approach it in a slightly different way. Um, it also allows us to see that thing which you don't usually see in encyclopedias, right? Which is the entire history of argument that's gone into that thing, right? I call this a historiography because it's the writing of history. It's people arguing over what is considered important. It's the process of argument that gets us to a position of encyclopedia. And as I said, that's not an entirely new thing, 
right? Encyclopedias have always been processes of argument, but because we've built a particular piece of software, in this case the software that drives Wikipedia, that process of argument, that history is now visible. Uh, it becomes something that you can actually argue around, that you can have arguments about, uh, a public historiography. Um, which is very different to the traditional encyclopedia. Something's kind of presented to you as, as a done deal. Uh, and so through engineering, through, this, through being able to read the technology, it changes what we're able to think and argue about. And I take that um, approach to kind of printing out bits of the internet or making them physical um, in various ways. This is a, another ongoing project of mine called the Drone Shadows. Uh, I have a very long-running interest in drones as, to me, again, another kind of piece of largely invisible technology. Um, there are things that, that uh, over the last few years have become, uh, they appear in the media quite a lot, um, but still most people have never seen one. Uh, and that's very, very deliberate, right? Drones are designed to be invisible. Uh, they're designed to be physically invisible because these ones, these huge military uh, robotic planes, fly at kind of 50,000 feet where you can't see them with the naked eye. Uh, but they're also politically invisible. Right? They're designed specifically so that they can be sent to places where it would be impolitic to send troops. Uh, so they, out of that, they create entirely new kinds of warfare. Uh, they radically change the sort of possible geographies of war through the use of this technology. So the Drone Shadows project takes these invisible machines of war and sketches them out just as outlines, but one to one size, right? And the first thing that people see when they, the first thing they say when they see these things is almost always, I had no idea it was so big. Um, which is like a really obvious thing to say, but a really crucial one. Because the next question is like, how did I not know this? Right? How, how have I not kind of encountered this thing? How have, I not, uh, how have I not had this kind of physical awareness of it before? Which leads to all those other questions of what, what purpose does this invisibility serve? Um, so that's another example of taking a kind of technological form and just trying to sketch it out in a way that makes it legible to us and, kind of, and therefore thinkable. It becomes something we can kind of think about and through. Um, which brings me to the, the main subject of what I'm currently thinking about quite a lot and why I'm here, um, which is questions of, of citizenship and identity. Um, because it was in the course of my drone work that I came across a, a couple of cases that really, really intrigued me. Um, this is a guy called uh, Mohammed Saka. Um, this photo was taken when he was about 15 or so, uh, when he was living in London, where he was born and grew up. Uh, he, he was born a few miles from where I'm from in London. Uh, he grew up in North London. He went to school there. Uh, his parents were originally from Egypt, uh, but he'd lived in London all of his life. Uh, and he had a British passport. He was a British citizen. And when he was a... Uh, Sometime around his 18th birthday, he apparently went on holiday uh, to North Africa, possibly to Egypt. Uh, it's not really clear where he was. Uh, but while he was out of the country, his parents um, received a letter in the post from the British Home Office, um, uh, which stated that uh, his citizenship had been revoked, uh, that he was no longer considered to be a British citizen by the government. And this is the letter that they received, which is... Uh, signed by uh, Theresa May, who was then Home Secretary and is now Prime Minister of the UK. Um, and uh, his parents received this letter. It's uncertain whether he ever knew about this letter, saw this letter, but about four months after this letter arrived, he was killed in a US drone strike in Somalia. Um, what had been made possible was through a kind of piece of legislative trickery uh, by the revocation, by the removal of his citizenship, he'd been laid open to being killed. Uh, this is a process that happens to people who don't have the protection of citizenship, which turns out to be kind of one of the most fundamental protections we have if we're lucky enough to hold a citizenship. Um, and at this point, I should say, I'm, I'm aware that this talk is quite US-centric and quite UK-centric, and quite a lot of my examples are from there. Um, and uh, citizenship, is, is here, I think, quite a, a, a very, very live issue, as we know. Um, but in this case, this was um, someone who you know, was from, from the UK, who'd grown up near me in London, um, and yet could be killed without any kind of legal ramifications by, the, uh, the, uh, by American forces. 
And I was kind of intrigued about how that process could occur. Um, and basically, this is the process. This is the legal equivalent of uh, like that Wikipedia changelog that I showed before. Uh, these are the various laws, um, the various pieces of legislation that are basically a step-by-step -step guide to how you, ki how you kill somebody. Right? On, on the one side, on the, on the left, you have uh, uh, the various British laws around citizenship that say who is a citizen, what your passport affords you, and ultimately how that citizenship can be removed from you. Uh, and the, the very last law in the bottom, uh, which says in progress but is now law, was the one that was written by Theresa May, now Prime Minister, to allow citizenship to be revoked. And in order to do that, they took certain wording from the UN Convention on the Reduction of Statelessness, which is a law that says you can't make someone stateless unless they commit acts which are not conducive to the public good, which turns out to be like a magic, magic set of words which allow you to do all kinds of things if you put them into your law. So we incorporated them into British law and used them to remove Mohammed Saka's uh, citizenship, which then allowed him to fall under the, uh, the American justifications for war over on the right-hand side that t basically turned him from someone who had all the protection of the British state into someone who could be killed, someone who had none of those protections. Um, uh, Hannah Arendt, this great theorist, uh, who when she was covering the aftermath of the Second World War, uh, covering the Nuremberg trials in particular, uh, she famously made the statement that um, citizenship is the right to have rights. Uh, without the cover of citizenship, you're essentially left open to uh, all kinds of, um, well, mostly terrible things happening to you, essentially. Um, and it turns out when you start to dig into the, the current situation around citizenship, there's all kinds of very strange and, and very odd things do, uh, being done to it. And as always, I tend to approach these questions um, through the, the lens of technology, trying to use technology and new technologies as a metaphor to understand them. Because for me, the, the technology is, itself is a metaphor that we're kind of constantly giving birth to. As we're constantly building new systems and new ways of living through technology, we're trying to kind of enact something to describe the world better as we see it. And so if we can read the technology, we can kind of read the underlying world. And as anyone who spends quite a lot of time on the internet today knows, we're essentially turning from um, kind of single solid subjects into these kind of floating clouds of data. Uh, that most of your interactions with the world today are not really governed by yourself as a person, but by the information that's kind of around you or out there about you that's used to make decisions uh, about you. Um, so as we go through life, we kind of accumulate this kind of information about ourselves, but that information is spread out uh, all around uh, in the various systems that we interact with. And so it, um, it stops being something that's sort of secure and reliable, but becomes something quite uh, kind of distributed and cloud-like in the systems around us. Uh, and this is happening very strongly to our kind of citizenships. Um, I am uh, lucky enough to be to hold what's considered to be a, a first-class passport, essentially, and there are many grades of this. I hold a UK passport, which is regarded by uh, the kind of people who rank these things as kind of one of the top passports you can have, because it allows you kind of more visa-free access to various places, it allows you to travel to these kind of, kind of things. Um, but as we've seen in the case of Mohammed Saka, that, that citizenship, that, that idea of the the kind of sanctity of the passport, that fixed nation of citizenship, is starting to kind of um, be eroded. And, uh, and that's a strange thing to happen because the place in which passports are activated, the place in which they're supposed to make you secure, is of course the most unsecure place of all, which is at the border. Uh, this place where you're, you have to kind of prove yourself more than ever when you pass between different states and different systems of information. Um, a good example of that is the, um, the system in the US which is uh, kind of particularly fascinating, uh, and, but also, again, I think is something that gets enacted here probably more often in people's everyday lives. Um, but this is a, a diagram of the US, uh, the US border zone, right? So we usually consider the border to be that point at which you actually cross over, the point where you have to kind of produce the passport, where you actually move between different states. But under US law, um, the border zone, i.e. the area in which you can be kind of questioned by immigration, 
be required to show your passport, be required to prove your, your citizenship status, actually extends with, uh, within 100 miles of the border zone. So within 100 miles of the border zone, US border agents are allowed to question people about their citizenship and identity. Uh, and as that map shows, uh, the border, most people in the US live within 100 miles of the border. Two thirds of American citizens actually live within that 100 mile border zone. So two thirds of American citizens live at all times actually on the border in that way. And actually that situation is, is not restricted to the US. Increasingly, and particularly because of technological systems that allow uh, our kind of identities to be questioned at every interaction we have with government, we all kind of live increasingly within these border states, which has very strange effects on citizenship. Uh, and this, is, this, was, this might show you how, how that actual questioning of citizenship affects us all the time. There's usually, if you're lucky enough, as most of us are, but certainly not all, to possess a citizenship. Uh, people have usually acquired that citizenship in one of two ways. Um, and those two ways are called in law just sanguinis and just soli, uh, the right of the blood and the right of the soil. Um, in most of Europe and the, uh, uh, most of Europe and Asia, it's a just sanguinis is the one that usually goes, the right of the blood. So if your parents have a particular citizenship, then you get that citizenship. In the Americas, they mostly use just soli, the right of the soil. If you're born in a place, uh, you get that citizenship no matter where your parents are from. That's why if you're born in the US, no matter where your parents come from, you get to have a US passport. Um, but that's not the only way in which citizenship is determined today because primarily of technology. So this is a, a document from uh, the National Security Administration, the agency, the NSA, released by Edward Snowden, um, which explains how they determine citizenship. Uh, and so why does NSA need to determine people's citizenship? Well, it's because, and this is true in most countries, uh, as an intelligence agency, as a foreign intelligence agency, they're not allowed to surveil their own citizens, right? So NSA is supposed to be like looking out all over the world for America's enemies, uh, but only at foreign people, right? Um, so they're supposed to completely ignore the activities of Americans. Now that turns out to be really, really hard if you are gathering in all of the data in the world into your data centers, which is what they're doing, right? They're siphoning all the information off the internet and from all the sources they can get it from. And they're supposed to, whether they do or not, that's another question, but they're supposed to then get rid of all the data about Americans. But they don't know whose data this is that they're collecting. So what they do is they make a determination of people's identity based on their behavior. They look at all this information about them and they essentially assign them a kind of percentage score Right? They say, well, this person's using these websites, they're logging on from this place, they're behaving like this. Nah, they're probably like 70% American. That makes them, okay, so they're probably American, so we won't look at their data, they say. Um, but if, you, if they make that determination, you're like 30, 40%, then you're fair game, right? They can, they'll, they'll look at all your information, they can pull up anything they like about you. Now that is, um, uh, that's a violation of your rights. Uh, Absolutely clearly. Under the UN Declaration of Human Rights, you have a right to privacy, uh, which should not be violated by anyone. Um, we know this goes on all the time, but it's a, it's a, it's a violation of your rights, and therefore it's a, um, uh, a violation of this protection that citizenship is supposed to afford you. So a US legal scholar coined this term, uh, the algorithmic citizenship. Not the, not the right of the blood, not the right of the soil, but this, this algorithmic citizenship, which is far less stable. Uh, something that's being kind of checked and questioned all the time. This percentage score being applied to you all the time as you kind of, um, as you interact with the world. Something that's kind of constantly checking on your, your data to see at any moment if maybe you're not American and maybe you should be targeted. And maybe therefore your citizenship is something actually that's, uh, that's being mathematically determined at all times. I found this notion to be kind of completely fascinating and I wanted to uh, explore it in some way. So I made a thing called um, Citizen X. Uh, which, is, which is a piece of software, essentially, uh, which you can download and use if you want. Uh, you can find it on the website. And um, what it is, is a piece of software that sits on your browser and watches you using the web. Uh, it does that entirely privately, just to be clear. Uh, I don't see any of that data. Uh, it doesn't leave your machine. Um, that's really, really important. Uh, it's also really, really hard. 
It turns out it's actually really, really difficult to build software, uh, particularly for the internet, that actually respects people's privacy. Uh, the whole thing is kind of by default designed to kind of share and put out information. So yeah, we did a lot of work to make it actually private. Um, um, so if you download this piece of software, you run it on your computer as you're browsing around the web. You can visit websites. You could go to Google. You could Google citizenship and see what it tells you. Um, and then you can press a little button, and you can pull up uh, a screen that looks like this, which tells you um, a little bit about what you're doing, what you look like to the internet, um, and, and what the internet thinks you're up to, essentially. So it says, this is one I was doing the other day, so I don't, the internet thinks that I'm in Cyprus, which was correct, and I'm visiting Google, which is uh, in the US, uh, and it knows the locations. It can figure out, to some extent, where various websites are, and it can show you what the internet thinks, thinks that involves. And you can do this kind of all over the place. Um, this is the website for the University of the Eastern Mediterranean that I was at earlier this week. Um, and if you, if you go there, um, once again, you're in Cyprus, but this is a, a website that's based in Turkey. Um, or you can come to Neem's own website and do the same thing. And you see that uh, this is a website that's finally actually based in the UK, according to the internet, um, uh, which might well be true. And what's happening here is that you are making visible the actual built infrastructure of the internet. The seeing that the internet is not some kind of cloudy, um, sort of uh, you know, imaginary world out there, but is a system that's built out of physical infrastructures, that's built out of uh, you know, machines in actual buildings that exist in countries and differing legal jurisdictions. And that every time you're on the internet, uh, not only is information about your behavior being you know, spread around in this way, um, but it's also traveling. It's traveling around the world and traveling through places that um, may do th different things with that data, that may affect um, the way in which you're treated and regarded. And over time, it builds up this very basic algorithmic citizenship, right? which is not as sophisticated as whatever the NSA does, I'm sure, but allows you to get some kind of window into how you appear to be to the rest of the to the rest of the internet. So as you can see, just through that short bit of browsing that I showed you, I'm starting to build up this kind of percentage score of, of my behavior. Um, and it makes visible that, uh, that the way in which, over time, that is changed by your, by your behavior. So you can actually affect how you're seen uh, by the web. And that's really, really kind of crucial, um, because it makes visible this fact that the, uh, the data that's used to make make decisions about you in all kinds of ways is something that's constantly in flux. It's not, a, it's not fixed like our sort of traditional idea of a citizenship or identity, but it's constantly being changed by, um, uh, by, the, by the things that we do. And that not only kind of creates this constant kind of border situation where everything's questioning in flux, but essentially renders us into that situation of quasi-statelessness, a kind of digital statelessness. Right? Where, where there's no fixed identifier that we can take through the world, but really something that's only conditional upon our behaviors. Um, and it also, I think, makes visible this incredibly complex system, starts to make visible that complex system, uh, uh, that we're actually all embedded in all the time without really thinking about it, which is the kind of global uh, infrastructure of the internet. Uh, that you can start to see the ways in which uh, uh, this... Um, these, these buildings full of computers in other countries or the cables that go under the ocean, the way they actually start to shape our daily lives. Because it's not just citizenship that's affected by this stuff, right? Um, if you, um, the data that you generate on the internet is, is used for all kinds of mundane things. It will determine things like your credit score. It will determine whether you get a loan or whether you get home or car insurance. It will determine the, even the prices of the things that you see on the internet. There's a lot of sites now which use um, variable pricing, depending on where you're based, you'll be offered different prices uh, for, for the things that you're trying to buy. So uh, a huge swathe of uh, things that we interact on every day are dependent upon this information about us. Um, and this kind of largely invisible digital infrastructure then starts to really reshape the physical world in quite important ways. Um, as I'm sure lots of you, ooh, you can't quite see what's going on should just be able to see that Cyprus is that hub there on the right. 
uh, where a whole bunch of stuff interconnects. Um, if you're not aware of that, um, you should be, that Cyprus is an incredibly key point where a huge, huge amount of internet cables intersect. Uh, so a huge, huge amount of the information flowing through the web flows through Cyprus in various forms, which is a huge part of the reason that the British have maintained bases here over the years, because it's an incredibly strategic point to um, intervene in and record uh, global communications. Um, and over the years, that desire to be, be at the network hub, uh, to be at the point of information flows, of critical information, has really, really reshaped geography in really important ways. Um, on, the, on the global scale, um, it's actually kind of, it's really visible when you start to track through the lines of this information, what it is, where it is that these different connections have come from and how they've been maintained. Uh, the lines of uh, internet cables follow almost completely the lines of old uh, imperial and colonial empires. Um, still to this day, the, the quickest way, the shortest route on the internet between West Africa to the rest of the world still goes through London. Uh, most uh, British uh, former colonies still connect back through London. Uh, the same is true if you're in South America, even if you're talking to computers in North America, uh, there's a good chance your data is still going via Spain. Because even though we supposedly have this incredibly kind of high-tech connection to the world, um, it still follows uh, the roots of telegraph cables laid down uh, by, by empires a century ago. And so what's actually really happened is that um, despite these kind of ostensible processes of decolonization, a lot of those power structures have really just moved up in upper level into the digital infrastructures in order to maintain them. And you see this uh, in the sort of global connections through internet cables, and you see it in financial networks as well. You know the way in which offshore finance basically has continued to, um, uh, has continued the power of those kind of old power structures, even when they've kind of evacuated from geographical space. And this is, again, what's kind of happening to citizenship now, that, that this power remains kind of concentrated through, through the use of technology. Um, oh, that's where I went today. That's <laughs> the beach near Paphos, where a whole bunch of uh, those internet cables come ashore, because I like to do things like that. Um, but that question of uh, how that uh, kind of global technological power still uh, reshapes the physical world in really important ways, as I said, is seen... Um, seen here in Cyprus and is seen in other really key places as well. Um, this is Diego Garcia, which is an island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, which um, the British uh, retained while we were mostly, uh, as I say, geographically evacuating ourselves from various colonies. Uh, when Mauritius got its independence uh, from the British, we, um, oh, no, sorry, the Seychelles, uh, we quietly kept a huge area of the Indian Ocean, which is now known as the British Indian Ocean Territory. And at the center of the British Indian Ocean Territory is this island or atoll, Diego Garcia, uh, which we hung on to because it's an incredibly useful listening point, uh, listening post to record everything that's going on in Asia and also has a massive um, US airbase at the center of it. Uh, in order to hang on to that island, in order to make it secure for American forces and for, for British Secret Service to listen in, uh, it was also necessary to render uh, several thousand people stateless. Uh, there were people living on these islands uh, up until 1974, people called the Chagossians, who'd lived there for, for several hundred years, um, who were unceremoniously um, placed aboard ships and dumped on docks uh, in, in the Seychelles and Mauritius, and who've been trying to get home ever since. Um, those people uh, uh, had all of their citizenship rights removed. Uh, previously, they'd been citizens of this place, the, the Chagos Islands, uh, which ceased to exist when Britain uh, decided that it was a useful point to, uh, to surveil from and to, to have a US base in. And they've been trying ever since to, to re-establish some form of citizenship which the British government says doesn't exist. And so if you're, if you're stateless, if you're made stateless in that way, you have no form of redress. You have no way in which to, um, to uh, persuade someone to like, take you back or to, to recognize even that you have the right, in this case, to return. So weird, weird stuff has started happening around citizenship in cases like this. Um, uh, the Gulf states, the United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Qatar, have um, a huge statelessness issue. Um, there's about 100,000 or so people. It's, the numbers are unclear because people like this don't get counted very well. Uh, but they have a, a population of people called the Bidun. 
And the Bedouin are people who, uh, for various reasons, don't have citizenship, but reside within those countries. So some of them may have been um, uh, nomads, uh, i.e. when those countries came into being in the 1950s and 60s, they didn't have kind of a fixed history in the place, or they may have been migrant workers who may have been there for generations, uh, but who didn't acquire citizenship when those countries came into being. And ever since, they've been trying to get some form of citizenship in order to do quite simple things like access government services to get kind of social security or to have the right to travel. Uh, you obviously can't move, you can't go anywhere if you don't have a passport. And also as those countries have you know, done trade deals and other things with other parts of the world, other countries in the UN uh, and other bodies have said, well, you need to sort out this statelessness problem. Um, it's not acceptable today to have large stateless populations. We, we know those people get treated badly, so if you want us to treat you well, you should treat your population well. And the situation that some of the Gulf states came up with this was to do a kind of hack on citizenship. Um, so what they did, what, what happened a couple of years ago, um, was that uh, the Kuwaitis went to uh, a place called the Comoros Islands, which is a small archipelago uh, in the Indian Ocean, another one. These places turn out to be very useful for powerful people. Uh, the Comoros Islands is a very poor country, um, quite undeveloped, uh, and really wanted some development money. And the Kuwaitis turned up and said, well, we'll give you lots and lots of development money if you give us loads of passports. Um, and what they did was they did a deal where the Comoros Islanders would declare the Bedouins to be citizens of the Comoros Islands. Right? So these people had never been to the Comoros Islands. Uh, most of them had never heard of the Comoros Islands. Um, but they'd been agitating to get citizenship for years. So one day, Kuwaiti government officials turned up and said, congratulations, you've all got citizenship. Here's your passport. Uh, and it's a passport to the Comoros Islands. And what this meant was that those people were no longer uh, classed as stateless under, under, um, under international law. Um, it also meant, of course, that the Kuwaitis and other governments could deal with them uh, uh, kind of however they wanted. Uh, it also meant they could make them leave. So one of their tricks was to give th this passport to someone uh, and then say, hey, you're free to leave. Go on a holiday to Thailand. Uh, ship them off, and then Thailand would take them because they had a passport now, and then they wouldn't allow them back again. So they could kind of offshore this problem as soon as they were capable of um, reassigning this person uh, to, from, from a situation of statelessness to citizenship. And of course, this also isn't a thing that only happens to, um, uh, to stateless people uh, or to, you know, to, to people without much power and agency. It also turns out to be an incredibly desirable thing for, for wealthy people. Um, uh, this is the website of Henley and Partners, which some of you may have heard of, which is the number one uh, uh, cons uh, citizenship consultancy in the world. So a few years ago, Henley and Partners, this legal firm, realized that there were a lot of rich people who really, really wanted certain other passports for various reasons, uh, either to do offshore kind of tax deals, to gain access to the European Union, and they work with countries to acquire passports for people who are willing to invest large amounts of money. And as I'm sure some of you are aware, Cyprus is one of the um, kind of very popular hotspots for this. Cyprus and Malta are currently competing, essentially, to, um, in, the, in this market for offering passports to people uh, you know, who are willing to invest a, a large amount of money in order to do it. So citizenship is something that can kind of be used against people in the various ways that we've seen. It's also increasingly something that's traded, that's marketable. Um, and in these various processes, you kind of see how citizenship really has nothing to do with territory anymore. Um, you know, citizenship, which really was also quite a recent invention. Um, you know, what we consider to be citizenship today really emerged with the beginning of nation states, in, in the kind of, mostly in the 19th century, before to, to be the subject of an empire was a very different thing. With nationalisms and, and the rise of ethnic national states, uh, citizenship became something that was very much tied to a particular piece of land. Many people found themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time when that happened, and many of them are kind of trying to realign it in certain ways today. But essentially, it's, 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 going, it's being reversed back out of this situation of being this fixed thing to being something that's, uh, uh, that's once again kind of for sale, that's, uh, that's applicable, that's movable, that's changeable. Um, so as I say, I always get really interested in the way technology reflects and explores this. Um, so recently I became a, um, an e-citizen of Estonia, um, which uh, is uh, a thing that Estonia has been doing for a couple of years, uh, because Estonia is, or likes to think of itself as, the most wired country on earth. 
So for the um, last kind of 20 years or so, Estonia has been really, really pushing its own digital services, investing hugely in information technologies, um, building incredibly good, excellent digital government services. Uh, so if you, are, if you live in Estonia, you can do pretty much everything online. You can do it really easily. Uh, so you can vote and you can do your banking and your taxes through a bunch of really, really good websites. And the Estonians thought, well, we're so good at this. Maybe we should offer this to other people. Uh, maybe we should compete with other states, basically because we've got a better website. Um, so they started offering this thing called e-citizenship, which allows you to go to an Estonian embassy and give, give some identity details and get, these, get this kind of digital identifier back. And then you too can open a bank account in Estonia and pay your taxes there without ever having to visit there. And in fact, you're not even really allowed to or supposed to visit there. This is a form of citizenship that explicitly says uh, you get everything apart from actually being allowed to go there. Right? It's citizenship without any geography at, at all attached to it. Uh, it's purely citizenship as a, as a service, as a kind of business agreement with you. Um, and um, this is uh, useful, I think, for a certain class of people. I have not found any use for this, I have to say. I went through this as a as an experiment to see what, it, what, what, what the process was kind of like. Uh, it's very much targeted at a kind of a, a nomadic business class, much like the same kind of people who are looking for the, the visas and citizenship and so on and so forth. Uh, but once again, we can see how it produces really quite strange effects. Um, so one of the things that the Estonians started to get worried about was now that they've kind of digitized their entire government so successfully, um, it actually makes them quite vulnerable in certain new ways. Um, the Estonians being where they are and given their history are particularly worried, aren't we all, about the Russians. Um, because uh, several times now they've actually been um, uh, quite serious cyber attacks uh, from Russia that have taken down uh, large amounts of the kind of Estonian digital state through cyber attacks. Um, and what they're most worried about essentially is that once you've you know, digitized your entire government, it makes it a lot easier to erase your country. Uh, before, if, um, you know, if, if the tanks rolled in, uh, there'd be certain kind of safeguards that would allow you to kind of restart that state elsewhere. But if, if an army comes in and just wipes all the hard drives, uh, then you've kind of lost all the information that, that makes up your state. So what the Estonians have started doing is backing up Estonia and other countries. Um, <laughs> they opened their first uh, digital embassy a couple of weeks ago in, uh, in Luxembourg. This is a data center in Luxembourg. Uh, within which there's a few servers which are Estonian sovereign territory, much like a traditional embassy where a bit of ground is kind of designated as belonging to another country. The Estonians actually have computers now in other countries containing backups of their country in case this in case this happens. So not just citizenship itself, but the state is becoming kind of digitized and spreading out to these places. Um, I was thinking about this quite a lot because I happened to be in, in Barcelona a couple of weeks ago uh, during the Declaration of Independence. Um, I was actually there for the kind of three or four hours in which Catalonia was legally an independent state. Um, and what happened around the Catalonian independence vote was really, really interesting um, because it was essentially, again, like Estonia, an attempt to uh, move the, a lot of parts of the state into this kind of digital realm where it couldn't be attacked uh, and couldn't be prevented by the Spanish state. So a lot of voting information was moved online. Um, many, uh, they used, in fact, a lot of the digital tax records to kind of uh, work out who was eligible for voting uh, and a number of other things. And the, the Spanish state responded to this by um, very violent censorship of the internet. I mean, stuff that would be... Um, you know, the kind of stuff that was supposed to be shocking when, when Syria or Libya shut down parts of their own, their own uh, internet, or Egypt did. Um, basically, the Spanish state was doing this to try and prevent the Catalonian uh, referendum taking place. Uh, they seized the .cat domain, which is the domain for, um, for Catalonia, um, uh, and arrested the people who administer that. And they issued court orders to shut down loads and loads of um, websites. They, they forced Google to remove voting apps from, the, from, from their store uh, to prevent people having access to this. And in response, the Catalonians um, uh, put, uh, started putting more of this information into uh, other distributed forms of systems. So one of the things they used was this thing, which has the brilliant name of the interplanetary file system. 
uh, which is a kind of alternative web. Um, it's, a, it's a way of uh, putting information on the internet that distributes it across multiple websites. Um, so it's kind of peer-to-peer -peer between different websites. So if you take down one website, the information is still accessible um, elsewhere, which is a kind of slightly abstruse technical thing. But I mention it because um, the internet interplanetary file system itself, um, if you can read the URL all the way up there, is hosted at something called ifps.io. And I mention this because .io um, is a... Uh, one of these you know, domain, um, it's called top level domain, like .com. Um, but .io refers to a very specific piece of territory. Um, it refers to the British Indian Ocean Territory. Uh, it refers to Diego Garcia, that place that I talked about before. Um, the, uh, when domain names were being kind of handed out willy-nilly uh, in, the, in the 90s, when the internet was starting to become established and international, uh, the British Indian Ocean Territory got its own domain, .io, um, and uh, gave it to someone to administer, a company based in the UK, uh, that has administered it ever since. And it's used by lots and lots of really techy domains, because it sounds a bit techy and cool. Um, but it is ultimately still totally within the purview of the British state to administer that. So while they removed themselves from the .cat domains, the Spanish activists, in order to um, remove themselves from the Spanish state, uh, they immediately placed themselves within the, the purview of the British state under this .io domain, um, the profits of which, of course, still accrue to the British state uh, and not to the, the Chagossians, those people I mentioned before who were, who were evicted. So this is what I mean by saying it's really, really hard to escape uh, these, these kind of historical um, imperial and colonialist um, uh, structures that still actually inhabit all of the contemporary digital infrastructures. And I was really, really thinking about that when I was in Catalonia because it really struck me to what extent uh, a, a declaration of independence of the kind that was kind of mooted there is, is very difficult to even think now. Um, this is, this is a, a, a diagram of the, the national grid in Spain, right? And it turned out that the Catalonians um, uh, probably didn't have enough power, uh, like literally energy, like electricity, to run a state uh, if they were to fully secede from the Spanish state. Um, likewise, um, there was only actually one direct internet connection uh, to uh, Catalonia from another country. Uh, they got all their internet from Spain and through uh, one, sorry, that's so faint, uh, but that's a cable that connects Catalonia on the left uh, to Italy across the Mediterranean. That these, um, and it struck me that these, these pieces of infrastructure uh, are the things that actually really define the geographical territories today, the things that, that actually connect. And, and I'm starting to think that the question for achieving some of the kind of ind independence from these historical um, situations is, is to start to bring some kind of emphasis to an interdependence, to the actual connections that, that, that connect these things. That's what I'm thinking a lot about at the moment. Um, and what I'm thinking about a lot as well is, is how we can use um, the way in which we've built technologies to continue to interrogate these questions, to continue to, to explore uh, how it is that the state kind of defines itself now and how we can, how we can respond to it. So in the UK in the last few years, uh, the government has also, like the Estonians, put a huge amount into uh, really, really good websites. Um, in the UK, it's got better and better to do the boring things like pay your taxes and get insurance and stuff like that through government websites because they've built really, really good ones. Uh, one of the parts of that is they've also put these websites um, public. They've, they've made them uh, largely open source. So not only can you go and visit the website, you can also go and explore all of the code that lies behind it. Um, so that code has been made available for other governments to explore um, and use. So, for example, the New Zealand government wanted to make their government websites better. Uh, they, uh, they took all the British code that had been written, they put kind of different crests and different headers on the thing, and they started to build out uh, better government services in their country. Um, and you get, again, these kind of weird side effects of that. So this is the, um, the change log for government policy in the UK. Right? So every time a new government comes in, uh, or even within a government when they change their policies, they, they, start, they have to update all the websites, and all of that data is still held. 
So because we've started to build these better web services, we're starting to have a, a Wikipedia-like history changelog of actual government policies, which is quite a radical change from the, the, um, the way in which a lot of this information was, was hard for publics to obtain in, uh, before. And so what I'm doing, one of the things I'm doing here is taking that information as well and trying to build out other things based on it. So I too, or you too, can also download that code and see and examine the way in which uh, the government is actually uh, functionally functioning, right? By which I mean so much of the technologies that we use every day are, are largely opaque to us just in the way that a huge amount of our kind of interactions with government are hugely, hugely opaque to us. And it's very unclear about what's happening. Um, and that often feels like something quite oppressive, that, that technology is something that's actually kind of distancing us from what's going on around us. But if, you, uh, if we build systems that allow us to express that, allow us to see it, these things actually become radically clear in ways that are really, really interesting. Um, technology is used to obscure many things, but it also means that lots of things that were previously invisible are now written down, like line by line, and they can be explored and, and critiqued in ways that weren't really possible before. So, what I wanted to, to bring out of that is that these various examples that, I, that I've talked about, these ways in which citizenship is being kind of delaminated from territory, the ways in which technology is changing the way these things are applied, is always a kind of uh, dual-edged uh, and totally contested situation. Um, what I'm trying to do in my work is explore the ways in which we can make visible the, um, uh, the changes that are happening, but also to look under them to see the social forces that are driving them. Um, a lot of the things that I deal with in my work are the ways in which uh, technology or the politics that underlie them are used to, to oppress people, to remove their agency. Um, but I, in each one of these examples, I continually find places at which it's actually possible to engage with and critique what's happening. Because I still think there's a kind of um, underlying drive to technology, which is trying to kind of speak to us, to trying to make this clear to us. No one set out to build the internet that we have today. It was created by people with m many, many different kind of plans and agencies, many ways of thinking about what technology would be. And so for me, it represents a kind of certain unconscious drive within us to, to represent the world better, to allow us to critique and think it in different ways. Um, and so while these questions of citizenship, questions of identity remain contested, remain subjects of power, um, they also give us the tools to think through them and think about them in entirely new ways. Thank you very much. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take them. Uh, or, yes. China has issued a sort of a, a white paper, I don't know how they call it anyway, it's an outline of a policy, a national policy, that they want to attach a social credit to each citizen, but they basically they want to judge you by the social, your online behavior, and assign your credit and use it for, uh, for the sake for trust, they, they say it's based on trust, they use some things I don't understand. But yeah, so, so, so this is a thing. And one other comment, this was kind of a, a black mirror of CDS, you have seen it. There was an episode who one lady lost her credit because she did something bad and she didn't get to the 25 p.m. and she got, went to jail. So how do you view this latest development? Yeah, I mean, th this, is, this is what's happening. Uh, the, ch the Chinese example, for those who aren't familiar with it, is a, uh, a new plan by the Chinese government to basically make um, to give every citizen a, a kind of citizen score, essentially, like a, like a credit score, but for everything. Um, that will be based on, um, not just on your financial information, but on all information about you, including statements you make online, uh, you know, what newspaper you read, what media you consume, uh, what your job is, all of this kind of stuff, and use that as essentially a determinant for um, your access to a bunch of services. Um, so that's the, that's, exactly the within a nation example of what I'm talking about at a kind of global scale of the way data is used to, to make decisions about people. Um, and it's, 
Yeah, I mean, the Chinese don't muck, muck about. Uh, it's, it's the kind of extreme example of what everyone is doing, but don't necessarily um, uh, make it as bold and clear as, 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 the, Chinese are going, as the Chinese state is, is comfortable with doing. Um, but that's exactly the situation. Um, and, and again, this is, you know, as your example for, of someone who, you know, loses their credit card and loses access to information, this happens all the time. Um, if you have your credit card number cloned or you have your social security number cloned or anything like this, that's identity theft, which is an entirely real thing that banks are increasingly kind of um, uh, warning us against or warning us about. Um, that just simply emphasizes the way in which, you know, identity in all its forms is, has been kind of totally separated from the individual um, and can therefore be kind of taken and used for, for, for other purposes, essentially. Is that your question? Um, your presentation illustrated perfectly the fact that the students here can be a very digital and immaterial idea and concept and all these consequences and understandings that exist in a sphere that is not material at all. But living in Cyprus, I've noticed that all that digital, let's put it, cloud idea, has uh, impacted the real life. Uh, even taking the example that you mentioned for, um, I don't remember the term, buying into citizenship, if I'm allowed to say that, for people that have this status, uh, financial status, ha financial status has uh, impacted our real life, and I put myself too, in the way that Limassol, for example, has developed. And uh, now taking it to your practice, that is also digital to a good extent, although it takes material manifestations. I was wondering how being here in Cyprus influences your work, how you going around, if you have managed in that short residency to make this bridges between the digital understanding of citizenship and the physical here in Cyprus, and how you see that coming into your practice, that this is what it brings in all the I, I, I can't say yet too much, not because I'm being coy, but just I don't really know yet to what extent like this is um, the particular, what, what I've learned so far. But I, but I do think it's, there are really key examples here, and I think your example of, of Limassol is a, a really, really key one. And that what I've, I've seen and understood so far, particularly what's occurring to the built environment in terms of development, in terms of property ownership, is exactly a direct result of um, the, the availability and sale of citizenship um, and of the, the, the nature of, of Cyprus as a, a zone in which um, essentially things can be done that can't be done so easily elsewhere. Um, and for me, I always look to, to architecture as a, a, a really powerful kind of exemplar of this happening. Uh, when you see you know, these, these ideas that seem quite abstract in terms of um, <coughs> you know, the sale of citizenship or the flows of data becoming reified as like massive apartment blocks, um, then that's, that's how, um, how this stuff manifests in the real world. Um, and, and these things, are, there's, a, there's a, um, a really good architecture critic who I like a lot called Keller Easterling, who talks about architecture as a spatial product. <coughs> I, it's, it's just the kind of, it's just the, the, the bit that kind of emerges out of all of these different laws and different data flows, um, it's the kind of solid form of it that allows it to kind of uh, to to change the physical world, and then allows that stuff to kind of go back again, right? So once you've acquired citizenship here, you build a business here, you can then use that kind of power base here to to affect stuff elsewhere again. So there's a kind of constant move between those different situations. Um, in a way, I mean. In, in a way that just continues to emphasize the fact that these are not separate domains, right? That they are, uh, the, 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 the digital, the technological is not some kind of separate zone to the physical or to the legal, the social, um, and the cultural. Um, that the, these things are utterly and totally intertwined. And, and that's, for me, what becomes an interesting opportunity to kind of read different systems. So for me, my, my kind of lens for looking at this stuff is, as I say, through technology, because I happen to have studied you know, programming, computers, this kind of stuff, which gave me a particular systemic literacy 
which turns out to be a really, really useful thing for looking at legal regimes or social practices as well. But each one of them can kind of reflect and, and be a, a way into seeing the other ones. Um, I was wondering about your thoughts because, so, the best that I see things through is how can we use this play that starts between the, the family and the real, so also with regards to finance and money and multi system and also boards and citizenship. But, like you said, the cables, they have a very physical manifestation, which physical things can be uh, sabotaged, for example, and those are weak points, or points of power. So, my lens is always how do we flip this to protect the most vulnerable in our societies and in our world? How do we reclaim power because we have power but we're not aware of power? We have just simply through numbers with regards to any elite system or any system that's trying to tell us that we have to buy our right to exist. So is there a kind of way that we could actually, or people could gather and to actually buy land, islands, because things are being sold all the time in Greece, for example. So you have an island which is in a strategic UK place where you can then create your own citizenship, which you can then give out to people, because we're increasingly doing things together, the masses are increasingly coming together and creating ways that you wouldn't even be able to imagine. So if you use all the knowledge that you have in any way to think about ways that we can move forward, in a real way as well as in a, a digital way. Yeah, um, I, I don't have a very good answer for you because I haven't come up with that idea, uh, but I'll, 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 I'll say a couple of things. So first of all, like, people have been trying to do that based on geography for quite some time. So there's this idea called micronations, for example. And micronations have been around for a while now. And micronations is quite a huge subject with lots of different versions thereof, but it's essentially people who try to set up their own nation on very much on the traditional model of a nation state. And some of those might have territory. For example, one of the earliest and most famous was a one in the UK, or not in the UK, outside the UK, called Sealand, uh, which was an old World War II gun platform, i.e. basically a pillar out in the, out in the North Sea, uh, the English Channel, uh, that was 10 miles off the coast, and therefore wasn't within British territorial waters. So a couple of guys sailed out there, uh, they raised a the flag, they said, we are the Republic of Sealand, they started issuing their own passports, um, they sold those passports, they did okay out of it. They put service there and had a data center there. Um, the problem with micronations is that no one else tends to recognize them, um, and it's kind of, it's basically impossible to break into the club of nations. Um, uh, this, is, this is called recognition. Um, when, when other states recognize you, which is obviously the, the, the situation that exists um, uh, in, uh, in Cyprus, um, who, who is recognized as a state and who isn't. Um, the micronation thing is, um, is interesting, but it seems to require a huge amount of power to, to get somewhere. I mean, the, 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 the other example is the, the movement amongst very, very rich people in the US to establish seasteading. Uh, right, which is where basically they think if they can build some kind of um, their own islands or floating islands or basically massive ships full of rich people, they can set up their own kind of uh, law-free uh, capitalist paradise on the oceans. So it does depend on geography in quite crucial ways, and geography comes with you know armed force and other things that are quite hard to fight with. So I'm more interested in the case of this of like how we get around the question of geography, which is intractable in certain ways, um, but, but the response to it is to facilitate movement, right? To, 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 to kind of reject these fixed notions of geography and start to, the, the thing that must be pushed for all times is, is freedom of movement and um, the ability to not be kind of trapped by those systems. Um, the thing that you made me think of in the way that you were describing what you would like to do, though, made me think of um, an example from the financial system, which is um, uh, the Strike Debt uh, organization, and particularly a project they did called uh, the Rolling Jubilee, um, which, uh, which I just think was one of the most kind of extraordinary kind of exploits of the financial system, uh, which was a process by which in the US, uh, a group of people fundraised um, 
a large but not immense amount of money um, because they realized that anyone could buy debt. Uh, so in, this was in the midst of the foreclosure crisis in the US where, I'm sorry, I know you're not doing quite okay. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, where loads of people were losing their homes um, because they had outstanding debt. Um, that debt was actually held as collateral by banks who can buy lots and lots of those bad debts and traded it for money and, and it used it as a commodity. And so strike debt raised some money to buy that debt very cheap. So even though it was hundreds of thousands of million dollars of people's debt, you could buy it for hundreds of thousands of dollars less. Uh, and so they bought lots and lots of this debt and then they forgave it. Right? They just, uh, one stroke, erased huge numbers of people's debts. Um, because they realized that that's how the financial system essentially works, that it uses that information, that data, essentially, as a tradable commodity. And by doing so, they, to me, they just kind of, they didn't just do this incredibly good thing of relieving people's debt. Uh, they also demonstrated to what extent the system is one that's, um, uh, one that's exploitable by everyone, uh, and one that's essentially um, also in flux, that's, that's uncertain, that is not this kind of fixed monolithic thing that we think it is. And so I, I think what may be possible to do with citizenship and things like it is to demonstrate in various ways the ways in which that, that might be possible. But at the moment, as I say, that's only being done at this kind of much higher level. Do you think that a digital citizenship or a physical citizenship, which, which one would you prefer? from like, all of the research that you've done? I, <laughs> what do you think would be... To, to, to have, still today, the, uh, a, 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 a physical citizenship is, is, is the, the most physically important thing you can have. Like, in terms of your life opportunities, chances, your very survival, that, that remains the absolute kind of base condition for, for, for life and agency. And I'm not sure that's going to go away. Uh, I think, you know, what I really realized doing this, this next project was that um, it's uh, um, uh, this, this notion of algorithmic citizenship, which I really set out to see if it's something that could be useful, essentially. Like, could we take this concept that was being, um, you know, done to people, essentially, by intelligence agencies, um, and could we turn it into something that was useful? And in particular, because at the time I was doing the project, I was thinking of the, uh, the EU referendum in the UK, um, you know, in which only British people were allowed to vote, which seemed ridiculous considering you had people of non-British citizenship, EU citizenship, and even non-EU people who'd been living in the UK for decades, who was going to be affected massively by that vote. Well, even um, UK people living abroad. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and so therefore, could some other measure or access to uh, a way of kind of qualifying a vote, could that be useful? I think, I, I think that's a terrible idea, to be clear, uh, it, it turns out, because it's obviously open to all kinds of more abuse by power. So I, I, I don't think any form of digital citizenship is going to help us break from this kind of model. Um, because it's always going to kind of rely on the notion of the nation state as its basis. Um, but what it might do is give us some impetus, some excuses, some ways of actually attacking the notion of national citizenship itself. Um, because it essentially proves the extent to which that thing that you know, any of us have spent significant time on the internet know out of ourselves already, that, 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 that nationality is absolutely in no way any longer the kind of main qualifier of identity, if it ever really was, right? Um, you know, and this thing I keep coming back to, how technology reveals a thing that really has always been the case, but has been harder to kind of express before. Um, you know, we, we most historically we've lived within very small bubbles, and so of course our identities have been kind of local in that way, right? But they've also, there's always been, for a long, long time, a huge connection but they haven't been visible and explicable in the ways that they are now because of the network. And so it feels to me a, a, a complete inevitability that this, these ideas of identity that underpin nationalist citizenships are changing. Um, and they're demonstrated, of course, by the people with excess power to start with. Um, but it's, so it's up to us to find like, ways in which kind of amplifying, exploiting that and insisting upon them um, and not just being like a top-down uh, imposition of those systems.